The lesson has already been emailed out uh, via email to all the members of the church. If you don't have it, please nudge the person next to you to send it to you. Uh, the lesson also in Samoan has been recorded by a voice recording. Uh, so I've already done it pre, uh, pre-hand. I, is that the word? Pre-hand? I think so. Beforehand. Beforehand, right? Uh, beforehand. Uh, so if you want to also listen to it in the Samoan language, uh, it's already prepared for you. Hello, <laughs> Um, but like I said again, good morning. Um, it's a great service already, you know. Um, I hope you guys are doing all right today. Um, I hope it's a bit cool at the back there because I know it can get hot. Um, but just a little announcement before we do go on in our lesson today. Uh, this coming Saturday is our Mercy Project. Yeah! Right, so this coming Saturday is Mercy Worldwide. For those of you who don't know, Mercy Worldwide is a benevolent or charity, for a simple word, charity arm of our church. Now, every single year, to, uh, in remembrance and also to signify the unity in we have in supporting our Mercy Branch, we do celebrate every single year by having one day per year for, for all the churches worldwide to celebrate um, uh, Mercy by going out and also offering help to the community. So this Saturday, we are going to go and give food or groceries or just a few supplies to families that are not really doing well financially. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, so please do understand that this Saturday, please clear your schedule for this Saturday. It's a mercy project. Everyone needs to be there. Mm-hmm. Everyone needs to wear a green plain shirt. Right? If you have a mercy shirt, great. But if you don't, just wear a green plain shirt. Mm-hmm. If you don't have one, just get a white t-shirt. Just chuck it in some green paint. <laughs> and go with it. Um, but it is a Saturday. And also, uh, on Friday, we are going to fast uh, worldwide, so all the disciples around the world, we're going to fast together uh, in, in, uh, just in the hope that you know, Mercy Day on Saturday will go well. So every, uh, this coming Friday, everyone is expected to fast, right? So uh, for those of you who are afraid of you know, fasting for 24 hours, it's only from the morning till Bible talk. Right, so just, you know that's a bit of an encouragement for some of us. But it's morning, right? Let's just say 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Uh, Bible talk. Does that make sense? Yes. yes. Um, and also, we've also emailed out um, the the One Notes, right? So if you guys have the One Notes app, it also has a table. I'll bring it up for you guys, and then I'll show you. Um, we have a table right here. If I would please have the church do it right after the sermon today. Uh, put in your name. What can you bring on this thing, right? If you uh, um, if you see on the list, there's only right now. There's only me and Jenna, Lope, Beric, and Patrick, right? I don't know where the rest of us are, but please fill it up. Okay. Put your name where you can bring. And uh, if a family member or a friend just wants to join along and give extra and so forth, just tell them like. I'm not going to stop you from being gracious and, uh, and wanting to help the poor yeah. whatsoever. But please, um, everyone is able to access it. Work together. Let's get our names in. And uh, make sure that we cover in the names of the things that we need to bring. And uh, let us know if you can bring. So this coming Wednesday, we're going to collect all the, the, the products together. Um, so that when come Saturday, you guys just got to show up. And then I'll give everything to... Uh, uh, Brown Girl Woke. So we're going to be collaborating with Brown Girl Woke. Some of you guys know about them. Some of you guys don't. Uh, I don't have much to say about them. I don't really know much about them. All I know is that they do these projects and we're collaborating with them. All right? So please, after midweek, collect everything. And uh, yes, please have it prepared by this Wednesday. Is everyone following? Yes. 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 Cool. Now let's go to our lesson. Uh, the title of today's lesson is Confession, a Must for All. So for those of you who are new or visiting, uh, as a church, we're, we are going through a study series or a four-part series on sin. Whoa. So the first night we talked about Phineas, right? Woo. Putting a spear to that sin, right? God yeah. deals with sin radically. Because sometimes, it's good to see it from God's point of view, because sometimes as human beings, we think our sin is not that bad, mm. right? Because we think, oh, I haven't killed anyone, or I haven't really slept with anyone. 
So it's okay. You know, I just only thought of it, but it's, you know, I've never really done anything with it. Um, but to God's eyes, it's actually something very, very damaging and very, very offensive. Um, and so, you know, after that, we went on a Sunday, Sunday, Wednesday, and then today we're finishing off with one of the most important things about sin, and that is confession. And like, I, like the title implies, it's a must for all. So if you turn your Bibles to Leviticus chapter 11, Leviticus. Turn your Bibles to Leviticus chapter 11, verse 45. The Bible says, I am the Lord who brought you out of Egypt to be your God. Therefore, be holy because I am holy. You know, God chose Israel not because they were holy or great. But God chose Israel to be made holy and then go on to be made great. You know, their holiness... And even the blessings that came from their holiness was meant to be a beacon to the whole world around, right? They were meant to be a beacon to point the whole world from um, getting every single man alive, pointing them straight to God. You know, that's like much, it's much like us today, right? God didn't choose us because we were great, right? God didn't choose us because, you know, we were muscular or... We were nice, we were good, we were smart. God didn't choose us because we were good at all. As a matter of fact, the Bible says no one is good. Right? If, so if someone's telling you that you're good, you're actually not good. Right? <laughs> Including myself. But um, the Bible says the reason why God chose you is so that He can use you to make you holy and then make you great. You know, part of being holy and staying holy is confession. Right? Confession, uh, for those of you who don't know, confession is an open public or formal statement admitting that one is guilty of a sin, crime, or wrongdoing. Normally, but not always, confession is always associated with the desire to change, desire for forgiveness, and also honest acceptance. You know, confession isn't just about getting something off your chest, right? Because uh, sometimes we can be like, this, I, I just want to get this up and then just go on and do the same thing, right? Yeah, yeah. Confession isn't about that. As lovers of God, we must always follow confession with repentance. So we'll go through four simple points today. It's a very simple lesson. It'll help you guys understand the need to confess. But um, point number one, confession is a must. So please tell me about Leviticus chapter 5, verse 1 to 5. Leviticus chapter 5, verse 1 to 5, the Bible says, if anyone sins because they do not speak of when they hear a public charge to testify regarding something they have seen or learned about, they will be held responsible. If anyone becomes aware that they are guilty, if they unwittingly touch anything ceremonially, ceremonially unclean, whether the carcass of an unclean animal, wild or domestic, or an un, uh, sorry, or of any unclean character, uh, sorry, creature that moves along the ground. And they are unaware that they have become unclean. But then they come to realize their guilt. Or if they touch human uncleanness, anything that would make them unclean, even though they are unaware of it, but then they learn of it and realize their guilt. Or if anyone, is thought, anyone thoughtlessly takes an oath to do anything, whether good or evil, in any matter one might carelessly swear about, even though they are unaware of it, but then they learn of it and realize their guilt, when anyone becomes aware that they are guilty in any of these matters, they must confess in what way they have sinned. So what we see here already is that confession is a must, right? It's not an if. It's not, oh, if my disciples are available, right? Like, I can't really confess to Douglas because, you know, I've got to confess it. I, I normally confess it to Eric, right? Like, it's, it is not, it's not about that. You know, it's not about... Oh, if I have time, I'm just really busy right now. You know, I can't really confess right now. Let me let me try to find time. It's never if oh I need it or uh, maybe I'll get it at some point when I'm ready. Right? It's always a must and it's always and always. Mm -hmm. You know, when you become aware of your sin, you are to confess it specifically. Right? Sometimes we can confess it and sort of like beat around the bush kind of it. You oh, know? Yeah. Like we, we talked about maybe we killed someone's pig, right? And we talked about, oh, there was this really beautiful pig. Right? Mm -hmm. It was nice and brown. <laughs> it had five, I mean, four legs. Four legs. <laughs> <laughs> four legs. Um, and we go on this whole, you know, and I saw it in, 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 in my field. And I just thought, you know what, I'm going to leave it there. 
And then I'll go in and I'll come back. And we go through all this story about, you know, the pig, the size, the color whatsoever. But it's just like, let's just great, get straight to the point, be specific, and what happens, you know? But sometimes it can be like that, you know? Um, but all Israel was told to help each other deal with the sin in their lives. You know, they, it was known, even from this passage, as we see, if anyone or another person was in sin, and they were not to testify publicly, they would be held sin themselves. So that's basically saying, so if I find out that Junior's in sin, right? And then I decide, okay, I'm not gonna really, I don't wanna hurt Junior, so I don't wanna really approach him, and I don't really wanna point it out. What happens is me not speaking out is me actually putting myself in sin, right? Because if you think about it, it makes sense. The reason why God holds you responsible, because number one, it's a very unloving thing not to bring sin up with another person. Because mm -hmm. that's like me saying, okay, let's just leave Junior to go on his own way and sin his brains out, right? And that's just me saying, okay, I'm okay with Junior burning in hell forever. And that's a very unloving thing you could ever do. Mm -hmm. Not only that, that's a very cowardice thing you could ever do. Mm -hmm. Not bringing uh, sin up with someone, basically because you're a coward. And the Bible says, according to Revelation 21, that no cowards will be in heaven. You know, there's also a public confession. If you guys go to Leviticus chapter 16, verse 20 to 22. 20 to 22, it says, When Aaron had finished making atonement for the most holy place, the tent of meeting and the altar, he shall bring forward the live goat. He is to lay both hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the wickedness and rebellion of the Israelites, all their sins, and put them on the goat's head. He shall send the goat away into the desert in the care of a man appointed for the task. The goat will carry on itself all their sins to a solitary place, and the man shall release it in the desert. Here we see that God commands Aaron, the priest of Israel, to publicly confess all of Israel's sin, making an atonement for them. You sort of ask, well, why does God want that? The reason why is God is looking for humility. Right? God is looking for someone who is God-focused, the man-focused. You know, when you're a leader, or when you're discipled by me, normally, if possible, I'll talk about your sin from the pulpit. Right? Oh, now, there's been times I've forgotten about it, like, Douglas has gotten away with it, you know, because I, I was going to talk about his sin at some point, but I was, forgotten. I was like, dang, I should have mentioned it, you know. It was, it was a good one. It was an actually really good, you know, nice, juicy story on it. Um, <laughs> But part of the reason why I confess people's sin up here is, you know, not because I'm trying to shame anyone, but also to keep people humble. Yep. Because when you're a leader, let's just be honest, when you're a leader, you kind of feel like, oh, wow, I'm actually quite awesome. You know, I'm up here leading the songs, right? Everyone's looking at me, following me. You know, you can actually feel that way, right? Mm -hmm. And some of you guys are thinking that already. Let's be real. I don't know about you guys, but I love my relationship with Joe and Carrie, right? Thank so you. every single time I see Carrie, she always says, Donnie, you're awesome, right? Oh. And I'm just like, Carrie, just, well, what did you say, Donnie? <laughs> <laughs> did you say, uh, did you want some or something? <laughs> no, you're awesome, right? I don't know any other thing that Carrie, you know, says that comes out of her mouth. All I hear from Carrie is, you're awesome, you're awesome, you're awesome, right? And then I come to Joe and he goes, bro, you're pathetic. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's the reality of it. I mean, obviously it's not, it's not the only thing he ever says, but this real sort of humility that Joe really brings with me is like, bro, you're awesome, but this is the truth. You know, you, you gotta work through these things. Mm -hmm. And it really keeps me grounded because I'm like, I'm only awesome because God makes me awesome, mm -hmm. right? And I appreciate uh, Lofa, right? Lofa came up to me last week and, and she was like, Amen. yeah, last week, uh, you know, during Sunday, in the beginning of the church, we were told that we were special. But in the end, we were told that we were pathetic. So I don't know which one it is. I was like, sis, it's both, you know? You're pathetically awesome. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, that's the point. It's like God makes us awesome, right? But we've got to always humble ourselves. You know? you know, most commonly, the reason why people don't want to confess sin is because they're really afraid of what other people think. Mm. You know, sometimes, even sadly, we can even be afraid of what other people in the church think rather than what God thinks. You know, I, um, in a way, I apologize, but not really. For, um, for I always pick on Lopez, right? Like, I always bring up Lopez's name and I say things. And after a sermon, Lopez would always come up to me and say, well, ma, yeah, always <laughs> Basically, what she's saying is, I'm really ashamed of you just mentioning my name all the time. 
But her saying that, I don't know, it kind of it, it kind of spurs me on to even want to say it even more, right? <laughs> and so the more she goes, oh, I'm really ashamed because of you bringing up my name. I do it more in more sermons, right? <laughs> but basically what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to really have her understand that, hey, it, it, who cares about what people think? Yeah. And in a way, I kind of push the boundaries a bit, just like, okay, let me just push it a bit until you get tired and just rely on God, right? Wow. But I was even talking about that with um, Tana. Um, you know, he was... Uh, you know, he's, he, amen, he's repented, right? Like all of us, we need to repent and just move on. But I was talking about that with, with him one time, um, and he, you know, he was just confessing some sin, and, and uh, he was saying, you know, bro, I kind of felt a bit, you know, uncomfortable with what you did. And we kind of really dug through it. I was like, I was, I was trying to teach him, he's like, bro, you gotta not worry about what people think. Like, who cares what people think? You know, if you messed up, or if you are pathetic, or whatsoever, or if you just, I don't know, just messed up an opportunity or whatever, who cares what people think? What matters is what God thinks. Right. You know, and that's the incredible thing about being a disciple is we don't really have to care about what people think. Right. Honestly, I don't really care about what you guys think of me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in some ways, shape or form, yeah. I mean, I care more about what my wife says. Oh. But I really don't care. I mean, why do you think I get up here? Why do you think I get up here and really tell you all my sin? Right? Because I'm just like, this is who I am. I'm not great. But you know what? God is going to lift me to be great. Come on, bro. You know, we must always have God at the center of our lives and not men. Confession not only humbles us, but also it's to make others aware of our sin. Mm. Um, not only for our protection, but also for their protection. Because if we don't confess our sin, other people won't know what sin is well. Mm. You know, even uh, my lesson on Wednesday, right? I was just confessing a whole bunch of things that I used to do and so forth. And uh, some of the brothers were like, oh, wow, I'm doing that as well, you know? And, uh, but that really helps people. It's like, wow, I see how that's wrong. I need to change it as well and protect them from it. Right. But we also got to ask the question, how did Aaron the high priest know about all of Israel's sin? Well, it's basically because people just kept coming up to him and confessing their sin. They're like, this is what I did. God knows me. You know, part of the ministry or part of being a disciple is that we deal with each other's sin. Right. You know, sometimes we feel like we shouldn't really be involved in each other's lives and sin. And we're like, it's not really your business. <clears throat> sometimes even us as brothers and sisters, we're like, it's not really my business to bring it up with that person. As a matter of fact, the Bible says when you become a disciple, every other disciple's issue and sin is your business. Right. You know? Your life is my business. Right? Mm -hmm. My life is your business as well. And I know it's tough because sometimes... We've been so used to people chatting behind our backs and so forth. Mm. You know, people saying stuff. And it, that stops us from even just wanting to be real and open. But God already knows it. Right. We're just trying to fool ourselves and fool each other. Yeah. But our, each and every one of us' lives is our business. The Bible says so. Point number two, confession starts the process of humility and repentance. Right. You know, in Leviticus chapter 26, verse 39 to 42, the Bible says, those of you who are left with, uh, those of you who are left, will waste away in the lands of their enemies because of their sins. Also, because of their ancestors' sins, they will waste away. But if they will confess their sins and sins of their ancestors, their their unfaithfulness and their hostility towards me, which made me hostile towards them, so that I sent them into the land of their enemies. Then when their uncircumcised hearts are humbled and they pay for their sin, I will remember my covenant with Jacob and my covenant with Isaac and my covenant with Abraham and I will remember the land. We'll stop right there. You know, confessing your sin is the beginning of getting humble. It is our responsibility to humble ourselves before God, not God's responsibility. Now God will humble you if you don't humble yourself. But it's the start of change that brings us back to God. You know, one of the worst things you can ever do is to be proud and wait for God to humble you. Seriously, if you look at the Bible all the way through, when God humbles people, only moment, you know, He just strips you down to the last bit that you ever have. But it's better for us to humble ourselves than God humbles us. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know about you guys, but have you ever prayed prayers like God humble me? Yes. Like, have you ever prayed that? Yes. Right? I get. I usually get to a point where I, I don't really like praying that prayer. Right? You know, when someone prays God humble me, I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah you you do you, bro. You know? But I'm not saying it's a bad prayer to pray. That's a very bold prayer to pray. It's a good thing. Mm. But I have this understanding that man, 
I'd rather humble myself than God humbling me. Now, I've only prayed once in my life where I just, I, there was one time where my heart was just really hard, and I just remember walking home from, uh, from uh, church, and I just remember walking home the whole way, I was like, God, humble me, humble me, break me, break my pride, humble me, bro. you know, I just, I just kept saying, humble me, humble me. But I was just at the point where I was just like, my heart was so hard, I needed God to humble me, because I couldn't humble myself. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. But I don't know, I mean, pray that prayer if you want to, but... You know, I, I wouldn't want to talk about it much, right? <laughs> Just humble yourself. Right? Yeah. Um, but it should not surprise us that we sin. Why? Because our hearts are deceitful. According to uh, Jeremiah 17, 17 verse 9, it says our hearts are deceitful, right? Yeah. Not only that, Hebrews chapter 3 verse 13, it says sin is deceitful. Mm -hmm. Not only that, but lastly, in John chapter 8 verse 44, it says Satan wants to deceive us. So we never should be surprised at our sinning. You know, the fact of the matter is, we all sin, right? So the point of you not wanting to confess your sin is actually quite pointless. Mm -hmm. We just got to be humble and confess. You know, confession also goes along with repentance. In Numbers chapter 5, verse 5 to 7, Numbers chapter 5, verse 5 to 7, the Bible says, The Lord said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, Any man or woman who wrongs another in any way and so is unfaithful to the Lord is guilty and must confess the sin they have committed. They must make full restitution for the wrong they have done. Add a fifth of the value to it and give it all to the person they have wronged. Again, we see here that confession is a must and it's not an option. You know, yet we see with confession is that we also got to make a restitution, meaning restoring something that we messed up or the order of something that we did. So for example, according to this passage, if I stole a hundred talas from Monica, right? If I stole that hundred talas and I confess my sin, I've got to pay that hundred talas back and also got to add on a fifth to it. So a fifth of a hundred talas, I believe, is 20, right? So that's 120 I've got to give to Monica. But that's what repentance is. Um, that's the word, you know, that's the concept that we call repentance. You know, it's not this idea that sometimes the Catholics do. I know that, I don't know, I don't... I'm not going to say I, I fully know what the Catholics do, but I've seen in movies, right? I, I watch a couple of movies, and I've seen in movies how uh, they go into this little like confession box, and they go, Father, forgive me for I have sinned, right? And then they, they say this, they say that, and then uh, the person goes, okay, you must pray this prayer, pray it twice, pray it two times a day kind of thing, right? And then they just go on. Right, that's not confession. Like, that's not true confession or true repentance. The Bible talks about here, you've got to pay for your sin. You know, confess, uh, confession must be accompanied with change. You know, public confession is also part of a demonstration of repentance. If you guys go to Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 4 to 7. Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 4 to 7. It says, When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Then I said, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love, with those who love him and obey his commands. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes be open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's house, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly towards you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. You know, here we see the words of a guy named Nehemiah. And we see, you know, a great leader in the fact that publicly he's confessing not only sin, the sin of the nation, but even publicly writing it down, even for us to read today. Mm -hmm. You know, he then went on to lead his people to action, to rebuilding Jerusalem, bringing glory to God. You know, confession, one of the things that's very important about confession is us speaking out loud. Because when we speak out loud what we've done, it helps us connect with our sin, right? Um, sometimes the reason we don't really repent and see our need to change is we don't really see how wicked our sin is. You know, for example, you know, we can go, oh yeah, like I lusted towards that girl, right? We say that, but we forget that, hey, lusting according to Jesus is committing adultery. So you're not just lusting as if like it's nothing happening, like you're actually committing adultery before God. Mm -hmm. And so us speaking at our loud, we really see how wicked we really are. I mean, think about it. Some of you guys have done things where you've gone to a brother and sister and go, bro, this is what I'm thinking, this is what I've been struggling with, and you're like, holy moly, that's super weak. You know? 
oh no, that's really bad. I need to repent, right? But that's what confession really does. Right. You know, confession. Sorry, confession also is a, can be accompanied by fasting. In one Samuel chapter seven, verse five to six, it says, "Then Samuel said, Assemble all Israel and Mizpah, and I will intercede um, with the Lord for you." When they had assembled at Mizpah, they drew they drew water and poured it out before the Lord. On that day, they fasted and there they confessed, "We have sinned against the Lord." Now Samuel was serving as leader of Israel at Mizpah. You know, confession can also be accompanied by fasting. Often, sometimes we can get to a situation where intellectually we want to change. But our hearts are just too messed up, too hard that we can't even change. Um, fasting also helps with the process of confession and repentance. <clears throat> you know, um, I was told even a story that when Joe was um, studying the Bible... When you study the Bible somewhere in like, I don't know, 1980s, 1990s, I can't remember, it's been that long. Um, um, but when he was studying the Bible, the guy that studied the Bible on him was on Wednesday, he's like, so what is your decision? Do you want to become a disciple? And he goes, I want to. I know I need to give up smoking. I know I need to give up what, I'm, what I need to give up. I know I want to be a disciple, but I don't know why I don't want it. I know I need to, but my heart doesn't want it. And he was talking about this idea that his heart just got to the point where he was, it was just so hard, he couldn't even like, just make a change. Like, it was just that he was stuck. His mind was going one way, his heart was going another. And it got to the point where they, they told him, well, why don't you just fast? And he told him, go on and fast. I challenge you. Fast. Fast until your heart changes, and then come back to us and let us know what your decision is. So he fasted from Wednesday on to Thursday. Thursday on to Friday, and by Friday afternoon, he was broken. He was like, I want to become a disciple. That's it. My heart is softened. My heart is broken. I'm going to become a disciple. But that's also another way of just really humbling ourselves before God. It's really soften our hearts and make us fully realize how unspiritual we really are. You know, confessing publicly with others in this example here creates a large scale awareness and accountability for change. You know, leaders wanting to become a great leader like Samuel here would do well to take note of the calling of the people they lead to, and having regular times of confession and fasting, calling people back to holiness before God. You know, that's what it's really all about, is bringing us back into the light, bringing us back into holiness. So us just really holding to the sin that's in our hearts, it's a waste of time. We're really just only killing ourselves. Point number three, the damage of not confessing sin. So if you turn about to Psalms chapter 32, verse 1 to 5, the damage of not confessing sin. So we see that not only confession is a must, and confession also starts the process of humility and repentance, it also has a damage when we don't confess. Yeah. So in Psalms chapter 32, verse 1 to 5, the Bible says, Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them, or whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through all my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. You know, when we keep sin unconfessed, it eats away at us and it destroys us spiritually. It will even destroy us emotionally, mentally, and even physically. You know, never doubt the, uh, the damage that sin can do you. It can seriously numb you out and destroy your entire life. You know, but it gets to the point where it destroys us spiritually, it separates us from God and even from other people. I mean, think about it. If, think about Think back to when you were in sin and you came to church while you were in sin, right? Like, weren't you really weird? I don't know about you guys, but when I've been in sin and gone to church, I'm just like, you know, just looking around, like, man, who's, who saw what I did? You know, it's like, oh, like, who was there? You know, and, I, and then when people are, are, are annoying, as normally, you know, people love to come and say hi to you, so yeah. then you're like, man, it's annoying. You know? and, and you get so bitter and you get so mad, but it really wasn't the person, it was just you. Yeah. But because you're in sin, you become so unspiritual. Then you decide not to give your heart and it just makes you grumpy and bitter. Wow. Right? It's disgusting. I mean, I don't know. I've seen some of you guys come to church and being in sin. I'm like, just go clean yourself or something. You know, it's just like, I, 
it's disgusting looking at you, you know? I mean, it's disgusting looking at myself when I'm in sin, right? But it really eats away at you, and it gets to the point where you're just like, no one loves me anymore, right? Like Thomas, right? Like, no one loves me anymore. <laughs> um, but it really is true. Like, it gets to the point where it's just like, because you're so unspiritual, you, you just point out every single fault that everyone has, and just goes, the church is not me. I don't want to be bad. I hate it, you know? But what it does is, it makes us very weak and very weak spiritually. You know, some of the most unco- uh, commonly, sorry, unconfessed sins we have are evil thoughts. And we justify them by just saying, hey, this was a feeling I had. Evil thoughts can really turn to destroy you. You know, undealt with evil thoughts, entertaining false doctrines, fantasies of life without accountability, a different worldly life, an easier path to lead, um, Others is very a da- is pretty much a dangerous end for a Christian. Okay. You know, sometimes we allow our mind to wander into bad attitudes and hate towards our brothers and sisters. I think it's not a bad thing. Bad thoughts is a seriously bad thing. Wow. That's why if you go to Ephesians chapter six, go to Ephesians chapter six. It's not part of the notes, but I just thought of this earlier. Oh, if you go to Ephesians chapter six, verse eleven, the Bible says. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. But if you jump down to verse 14, it says, Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish, uh, sorry, extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Lastly, it says in verse 17, Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. You know, I love in verse 17, it says, take the helmet of salvation, right? It talks about a spear, this, sword, this, whatsoever. But when it comes to the head, he's like, take the helmet of salvation. Why? Because the helmet representing salvation is basically what will save you in the end. Because it's stopping you from all these evil thoughts that go in. And that's why I say, put the helmet on. Because why? The helmet is meant to protect the head, right? For anything that comes along, whether it's a rock or whether it's a spear or whatsoever, I don't think a spear, you know, the helmet will block it. But that's what the helmet is for, is to protect the head, right? In the same way, we've got to protect our thoughts. And by protecting our thoughts, it means for us to confess. When you don't confess even the thoughts that you have, you are damaging your thoughts and you will damage your life. And according to the Bible, it's a helmet of salvation. That means in the end, you will not be saved. You will not stay faithful. You will fall away if you don't watch what you think of. Because like what we talked about last week, what you think of ends up in the heart, and what's in the heart will end up being your life. Right. Does that make sense? Yes. And so, you know, we've got to get used to this thing of, oh, I've got an evil thought. We've got to not brush it aside. Especially in our culture, we're used to just saying, oh, it's just an evil thought, you know, let me just brush it aside. No, we've got to get time. That's the purpose of D-Times. You confess, like, man, this is what I was thinking. You know, I, I wanted to leave the kingdom. You know, I wanted to uh, get with this girl. Or I wanted to commit sin. I wanted to watch pornography. I wanted to masturbate. Whatever it is. Like, all these different sins, we need to confess it out. Why? Because if we don't, we'll end up falling into it. But sometimes our thoughts convince us that it's the truth, but it's not. Now, I think one of the people that's very good at this is Doug, right? Yeah. There's not a single thing you tell Doug that he just like, you know, he just takes it in, stuffs it in, and walks away, right? Usually Doug's will, Doug will go, like, if he doesn't like something, he'll be like, oh, yeah, bro, you know, I'll get my heart to run, bro, you know? You know, I don't like it, but I'll get my heart to run, right? If he doesn't like something, he'll just say something like that. I'm like, okay, yeah. cool, I know he's got something in his heart, but he'll do it with it, you know? Yeah. Um, but that's what we got to get, like, that's the a, that's a situation we got to get, like. we got to stop this idea of just, the background we've grown up in, where we're not supposed to share our thoughts, where it's seen as weak to share our thoughts. As a matter of fact, it's better to seem weak than actually be weak. Wow. You know, Satan wants us to not prosper and uses our pride to hide our sin. You know, Satan wants you to keep quiet about our sin. Why? Because it's a foolish thing um, to, you know, to even deal with your sin. It's actually something that Satan really wants for us is to leave our sin unconfessed, leave our sin undealt with, and just go on in the same process that we are in. Right. But without confessing, and we don't, we don't actually not only deal with our hearts before God, but we don't actually even get the help that we need. If you guys go to Proverbs chapter 28, verse 13. The Bible says, Whoever conceals their sins does not prosper, 
But the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. You know, our undealt sin becomes obvious sooner or later. Right. Right? It will pop up at some point or not. But you gotta ask yourself, the Bible says here, like, if you confess your sin, you will prosper. Are you prospering today? Mm -hmm. Right? Are you doing okay spiritually? Are you doing all right spiritually or not? The Bible says you will never prosper unless you confess. Right. And so if you really want to prosper, it's a simple. Confess, right? Um, but confession really helps us because sin really eats away at our hearts. Time does not heal your heart. It really doesn't. Confession does. Because mm -hmm. right? sometimes we can think, oh, I'll just leave it some time. Or maybe, let me just leave it for about two weeks. Let me just seek out with all my heart and then go confess. Right? No, it doesn't work like that. You've got to deal with it right there and then. You know, some people in life, they've gotten used to just rolling with it, right? They just got used to it being numb and being okay with just moving on in life and not dealing with their sin. Right. You know, I, I was told a story of um, a woman back in London. One of, the, uh, one of the brothers or so forth, a couple of the brothers and a sister and so forth, they went to her house to study the Bible with her. Uh, they got to know her and she was... She was this incredible, like, old woman and stuff. Like, she was serving, she was hospitable, she gave food, and she was always joyful. She was known to be always joyful, always happy. And so when they started studying the Bible, they found out all these different layers of just pain and hurt and numbness. It was just getting to the point where it was just, like, blank to her. And it was eating at her from inside out. And outside, she was good, but on the inside, she was dying every single time. And what they had found out is that this lady was without a husband because she killed her husband and buried it under the house. Sometimes people just roll on with life accepting and being okay with it. But when they started studying the Bible, they just went through all these layers and she was just so messed up. Like It was even to the point where she couldn't really connect what she was thinking with what she was feeling. Like It was like two different directions going off the side. Why? Because of all these years of just concealing and hiding her sin. Wow. And so, conf you know, sin does eat us from the inside out. We've just got to deal with it by confessing. Fine. You know, I want to ask you, how is your life going spiritually? It's very easy to walk in here and smile, right? Mm. It's very easy to walk in here and sing your heart out. Give some, you know, money to the plate and stuff and cry or whatsoever. But how are you really doing spiritually? Are you flying high spiritually? You know, when was the last time you were really open about your life? And you've got to ask yourself, what is really going on in your heart? Don't wait until it's too late. Yeah. You know? I want to ask you, has Satan deceived you to think that you will be happier if your sin is unknown? Because that's really what he wants you to believe. Because the Bible speaks so much against it. You know, in Revelation chapter 12, verse 9, it says, The great dragon was hurled down. That ancient serpent called the devil or Satan who leads the whole world astray. You know, do not be led astray by the world. Why? Because it says that Satan leads the whole world. Right? Just because other people don't confess their sin doesn't mean that you don't. Right? As a disciple of Jesus Christ, you are to do so. Point number four and last and final point, the benefits of confession. If you go to 1 John chapter 1, verse 7 to 9. The Bible says, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. You know, I love how it says, if we claim to be without sin... We are called liars, right? We deceive ourselves and it says the truth is not in us. You know, just saying that you don't have sin doesn't mean that, you know, because sometimes we look at this and say, that's why you should not say that you don't have sin. No, it's not just that. Even not confessing is claiming that we don't have sin. Right? So when we walk into a deep time, when we walk into church, when we walk to whatever that we're going to and don't confess us or tell what's actually going on in our hearts, we are actually claiming everything's all right. I'm perfect. I've got no sin. Right. And the Bible says there is no truth in you. There is no truth in you. You know, Satan tries to deceive us and makes us fear that we will not receive mercy from those around us and even God if we confess our sin. Like I said, you know, we all sin. Confession should be a regular part of our lives. Right. 
we must just we must get to a point where we just confess our sins like crazy, right? We gotta annoy the next person next to us because we're just like, hey, can I confess my sin? It's like, bro, seriously again, man. <laughs> um, I know when I was in Sydney, there was this one brother called uh, his name was uh, Brandon, right? Brandon and Emmanuel. These guys, every single night, they, you, you know, you kind of know, you kind of get to this idea that you actually know when they're gonna come in, like around like ten thirty or ten. They'll come like quietly next to your bed and they go, what's up bro, you alright? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you alright? And, and I'm just like, yeah bro, I'm alright. And they go, can I just confess some sin to you? And then they just sit there for the next 30 minutes. <laughs> and you're just like, I don't know what to say, I'm a, I want to go to sleep. But he's also going to confess the sin. Yeah. And then after that, he goes, okay, thank you so much. And I'm just like dead tired, and they're like, happy going around. It's like, ah, brush your teeth, and then go to sleep, right? And then it got to the point where I kind of realized when the time is, or, or just even like how they go all silent and then just come to you. So sometimes I'll go to sleep before them, right? <laughs> <laughs> or sometimes I'd hear them walking behind me. It's like, good night, bro. I just gotta, you know, I gotta wake up early tomorrow. <laughs> um, it's sinful, right? I just, you shouldn't do that. Like, I've done that once and I was like, dang, that's not good. I need to have this brother confess. But he didn't use that as an excuse. He would just go on and go to another brother and so forth. I'm like, ah, yeah, there you go. You know? <laughs> but that's the habit that we've got to get to. Yeah. You know, that's the purpose of brother's household. It's not to live your own life and block your own life from another brother. Like, that's a brother's household. It's to help you just clean your mind, clean your thoughts, right. clean your heart. you got to use the people around you. That's why it's important that you're around the kingdom all the time. Because we get attacked with all these thoughts. Why? Because even on billboards that we see right now, we see a woman with a bikini, right? Even the ads that we see right now, women with bikinis, right? Or just men with just showing off their bodies and so forth. There's sex all around us today. And so, yes, we are going to have bad thoughts in our mind. It's just natural. But we need to deal with it and not make excuses. You know, confession is how we remain pure. Our purity needs to be constantly worked on. It's not something that just suddenly happens. We've got to always work on it. But uh, the main drive that you should have in confessing is, remember back to when you were baptized, right? Mm-hmm. I don't know about you, but when I, when I got baptized, after confessing all of my sin, I was just like, I don't know, I remember just looking around, I felt like there was a whole stadium around me looking at me. I was just like, yeah, I'm, I'm great, you know? <laughs> and I remember walking home after my baptism, and I was like, man, so that means if someone comes up and kills me right now, I'm going to heaven. I remember just walking boldly. I was just like, oh, yeah. You know, I was walking in front of the road. I was just like pretending not to see the cars. And it's like, if one of these cars hit me, I'm going to heaven. And I was so happy. I wasn't even afraid of a single thing. I was just like, holy moly. I've never felt this happy before. I was just felt so free. I was like, if I die today, I'm going to heaven. Right? And then the next day I died at Nudge Street. Um, but, um, no, I was just really happy. The next day was the same thing. Why? Because I just let go of all these um, sins that I have. And I remember just feeling, I don't care if someone talks to me about my sin. Like, yeah, I've told everyone and I'm going to heaven. But it was just this real purity, this real heart of just like being free. I mean, think about it. Why are the kids happy and adults depressed? Right? Have you ever heard a kid that's depressed? No, why? Because there's this purity there, right? There's this, this real purity there where they're pure, they're innocent. There's nothing, you know, they they they... You can see everything that they do and so forth. There's nothing that they're hiding. And yet with us adults, we're depressed. Why? Because we hide so much. Amen. Whereas if we just become pure by confessing, man, the joy that that brings, it's incredible. Yeah. You know, find that joy and make it a drive to confess. Lastly, you know, there is power in confession. In James chapter 5, verse 16, it says, Therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. You know, confessing will help each other pray for each other to be healed. And it talks about this fact that, you know, the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. You know, are your prayers not effective? The reason being is you're not being open about the truth of what's going on. Sin is a disease that needs healing and needs medicine. And the medicine is confession in God's word. You know, in conclusion, confession is a must for all, right? Whether you may be a woman of 30 more years age or 30 below whatsoever, maybe, maybe you're a man or whatsoever, maybe you're muscular, maybe, I don't know, you're skinny, maybe you're fit, maybe you're not. It doesn't matter. You need to confess, right? It doesn't matter how big you are, how buff you are, the sin will eat the life out of you. I'm serious. It will. And don't wait for time to tell you that. Just confess and deal with it. 
Point number one, confession is a must. Point number two, confession starts the process of humility and repentance. Point number three, there is a whole heap of damage on not confessing sin. You know, after talking about sin, most of us will be tempted to be like, I don't want to confess my sin anymore because he might rebuke me for the pulpit, right? <laughs> but the truth is, no, it shouldn't stop us. Because it's all about God, it's not about people. Point number four, the benefits of confession. The benefits of confessing and being real and open is endless. Confess today and be blessed. Love you guys so much. Amen. Amen.